Welcome. Uh, welcome to the inaugural Maryland College STEM, College STEM Conference. It is a pleasure to have all of you on behalf of the steering committee who have worked very, very hard from day one. It is a delight to see all of you. Uh, there are quite a few members I do want to acknowledge. So uh, one of my roles today, by the way, I am Raza Khan. One of my roles that I've been told by John Hammond of Montgomery is I have to thank every single one who has worked. So that's going to take me about 48 hours. So I'll be here till Sunday. Um, but however, at this point, I do want to acknowledge a few people uh, before we do an official welcome. Would the uh, members of the steering committee, and they're not all of them are here, but would you kind of stand for me, please? The steering committee members, please give them a hand. Um, just to give you an idea, there are 21 committee members, and by the way, three of them are outside, so do thank them as well. Um, but there are 21 committee members from 10 different community colleges who worked on this project from January 1. Uh, I know the three committee members know this. We were anticipating 50 at the maximum, and uh, we have top 300 uh, already for the two days. That's a really good achievement. So that says a lot about the STEM for both faculty and for the students who are here as well. So for students, we are looking forward to your presentation. Um, I do want to mention how this came about. It was at a Georgia STEM Tech Conference. Uh, uh, Professor Vanessa and I from Representative Carroll, and we were supposed to meet with uh, faculty members uh, and the dean from PCC, uh, Dr. Amika Malwishi and Dr. Nima Laki, for five minutes. It turned out to be four hours. You know, next time since a faculty member tells you to just meet for five minutes, uh, you know what that means. Uh, but from there on, it came about that we did not have a platform as community college to get together uh, and bring in students as well. Now, we do recognize that there is a fact and it does this wonderful work, and we do support it, but it still was missing a component, which was the students. And to give you an idea, at this conference, give a hand for the students, because there are 157 students registered. From that catalyst of the discussion that we had with Dr. Malaki and Malabushi, Dr. Chang of Montgomery and I met and we brought in uh, members who were interested at the AFAP. Uh, and it came about and people were so receptive that they, we had faculty, the chairs and the deans of different college come in and said, okay, let's do this. Uh, and to come on a Halloween night, I was saying, I think we should just go down from 50 to maybe 30. Uh, but again, it is uh, unimaginable and this shows the passion of STEM for all of us. Um, to the students, uh, this is your show. Today is your day. Uh, simply put, we the faculty, we the mentors, we the chairs, we the deans are here to support you. Today, you have about 10 presentations. They are all for you only. And then we will all be here, hopefully by the guys. Don't sneak out faculty members, right? I'll find you if you do. We'll all be here and we'll be listening to your presentations for those of you who are attending. And then we do have a tree, it is Halloween, so we do have blood and we do have liquid nitrogen. <laughs> Not in the same room, hopefully. Um, I don't know what they have planned, but we do have blood, we do have liquid nitrogen, we do have a leaf blower, we do have air dryers. No chainsaw, sorry. So, um, we'll do that here. So, and, uh, so the plan is we do a keynote and then uh, we have sessions and then we'll have appetizer for the faculty. We'll keep the faculty out while the students have the STEM activities. And then we'll move the day for today. The final thing also will have another professional development for tomorrow. At this point, however, I don't want to take any more time from the uh, keynote speaker. I do want someone from Montgomery to come and give us official welcome to this beautiful building that they have, a uh, bioscience building. And uh, Martin Gladiver, who's a provost of the campus in Germantown, is gracious enough to come in today and give an official welcome for that. Good afternoon. It is an enormous pleasure to welcome all of you to Montgomery College, to the Germantown campus, to this beautiful bioscience education center which we just opened this fall. You are among the first visitors and the first to use the conference center. But most importantly, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the first Maryland Collegiate STEM conference. That's the most important activity of today. And having stepped out of the classroom a few years ago to become an administrator, I'm so glad to see that things have not changed. The front row is virtually empty. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel right at home to have empty seats right up front. Um, I, I want to ask for thank yous. You know, if you've ever watched the Oscars, the Academy Awards, 
these people get up and get they give these lengthy speeches, thanking, 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 and only one of those is the best picture. Who's best actor? Who's best actresses? But if you've ever been involved in organizing a major event, you know that it does take a village to pull off a STEM event like this. And I do want to give a shout out, and, and some of you have stood already, but Dr. Chang, who has, is, has left Montgomery College, but was able to join us again today. Thank you, Dr. Raza Khan, who just addressed you, uh, from Carroll Community College, and Maria Furness. Uh, Dean John Hammond from Montgomery College is slipping, he, he slipped in the back after having taught a class. Um, and Michael Chase, um, who has graciously provided some uh, funding from the GT Step Grant, which the college has, again, to help bring this off. There are also some sponsors I'd like to thank. Some of you may have already had an opportunity to visit their tables and their setups uh, before you came in as you registered. Um, the HHMI Biointeractive Pearson Ludesco Bone Club, that's fun. Uh, but in addition to taking the village, um, it also takes some funding to have a great event like this. So we are grateful to those who have helped to sponsor this event. All of you know the importance of STEM fields, and to this audience I can say you also know the fun of being in a STEM field. So I hope that this is not only a, a stimulating, intellectually stimulating event, but it is also fun to be with people who share your interests, who share your passions, and that you have an opportunity to really talk to each other. You know, in this age of, of internet and email and all of the ways that we can communicate around the planet at this point, there is still something marvelous about having face-to-face -face opportunities, about having one-to-one -one or two-to-one interactions. And I, I noticed a bunch of you standing at some of the poster sessions. So take advantage of that real face time um, to, to interact with each other. And, and as I said, have, have fun, but also enjoy the stimulation and to see what your colleagues, your student colleagues are doing. And that's the most impressive thing I think that's happened here, some of the fabulous work that's being done by students at community colleges. Um, I, I do, oh, I also, before I introduce the keynote speaker, I do want to invite you to take, wander through the building um, as you have time between sessions or whatever. It is a beautiful facility. Um, our students are very fortunate. Um, some of them are here, they can tell you what our old lab facilities look like. And, and so we're thrilled to have this facility open and um, have, be able to host events like this as well as the academic opportunities for our students. And now, since I'm not standing between you and food, so I'm feeling in a somewhat safe position because you've just had lunch, but I am standing between you and the keynote address. Um, Christina Badger is a visiting instructor from Allegheny College in Maryland. She plans to begin her doctoral degree in September 2015 in marine biology. She received her bachelor's degree in marine biology with a minor in chemistry from Fairleigh Dickinson University and her master's degree in marine biology from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. She's done research at the Smithsonian Environmental Center Research Center on carbon cycling in tidal marshes and has worked as a marine mammal observer in an oil exploration vessel in the Gulf of Mexico, including the Deepwater Horizon. Her master's research focused on natural resistance in eastern oysters to parasites present around the east coast. Ms. Badger's presentation will focus on STEM engagement, motivation, searching for mentors, and settling, uh, setting the foundation for STEM success. Please join me in welcoming Christina Badger.
working on cool apps on your phone. Uh, it also comprises things like working in laboratories, sitting at home, working at homework, and being out in the field, studying how organisms interact with each other, everywhere from Maryland to Antarctica. People with STEM degrees can be found in the newest, most advanced buildings, huge high-tech facilities, and out in the mud collecting oysters and sediment samples. That one's me. Um, so in so many different areas, and with an ever-growing body of knowledge about our bodies, about the planet, the universe, and ways to make life better and to interact better, it obviously takes a huge array of people and personalities and ideas to continue this process. The students and the faculty are here because the, you guys are all interested in this information. Most of the students are just beginning their journey in the STEM fields. You're taking your first classes at college, you're working in labs for the first time, and I'm mostly going to talk to you. You're the ones who we're trying to get involved on your journey, and we want you guys to all succeed. I know that all of the faculty here truly want to help the students pursue their own careers in STEM. Some of you may be getting ready to go into careers after your two-year degree. Some of you may be transferring to four-year degrees. Some of you may be thinking about going to grad school eventually. Well, I have good news and bad news. So first, the good news. Working in STEM is exciting and challenging. It can be so rewarding. And there are a lot of job opportunities, which is something that is very important to consider when embarking on your career. But research and working with students is what I personally like to do. There are lots of jobs in different industries, from tech companies to pharmaceutical companies, healthcare to being a statistician for a sports franchise. I know there's one campaign right now with GE showing all of the different technology and science jobs that they have. For those who have aspirations of continuing on to get a PhD, a recent NSF study found that of the unemployment rate for those with a STEM PhD in research had a one-third unemployment rate of that of the general adult population, only 2.1%. The PhDs that they looked at comprised a huge array, biology, agriculture, environmental science, engineering, the physical sciences, math and statistics, and computer and information sciences. So there are so many jobs in these fields that you'll be able to find. In addition, the growing body of knowledge and the rapid pace of advancement in um, technology has led to the prediction by the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics that there will be an increase of 22.8% in software development jobs just over the next seven to eight years. Again, this is mostly due to just how fast technology is advancing and new jobs are being created that didn't exist five to ten years ago. We're also very lucky to be studying in the United States. Industrialized nations have a unique situation. The infrastructure that we have allows there to be links between having an interest in science and being able to learn about it even at home on your own time. You have opportunities to gain experience and you have opportunities in education to look at. So now for the bad news. Unfortunately, 40% of students who in their first year plan to major in a STEM field will either leave to a different major or they won't complete any degree at all. When you include, when you include pre-medical students in that factor, it goes up to 60%. So why are so many students leaving? Obviously, the students here are very interested and would never think about that. But they face the same challenges as all of those who don't go through with it. The first one is, there are difficult courses. A lot of the information in their first years is going to be theoretical. While you do get to have fun and laugh and learn new things, you're also learning complex theorems and working through at your own pace. 
you don't have someone there all of the time to help you. You're reliant on yourself. Also, in nature, in bigger schools, there's often large introductory classes. When you have so many students, it can be hard for a student to approach a professor and actually ask for help. You feel like you kind of get lost in the crowd, and that's something that no instructor wants. It's also been found that those in the STEM fields get lower grades overall compared to the other um, departments and schools. This is because in the STEM fields, there's generally a right answer. You can't just wing it and rely on your personality. You do have to figure out what the answer actually is. As you move on, you'll begin developing your skills in critical thinking and solving problems different ways. But especially at the beginning, do you have to find that right answer? There's not much leeway for professors to give you credit for thinking creatively if you didn't solve the equation correctly. The other thing is that there's a lot of foundational information that you need. It may seem sometimes like professors are being extremely strict and graded harshly, but you need that information to progress in your field. If you're taking Chemistry 101, those concepts are going to be repeated over and over again. And the professors can't go back and reteach it every semester as you're going through. So that's why they expect you to be able to complete the task when you're doing them. Again, it's not to be mean. <laughs> it's so that you know what you're doing. A lot of these fields often relate to each other. I know students sometimes have a hard time with math, but you need that in any of the other STEM fields. Also, a lot of the sciences relate with each other. Chemistry and biology work together all the time. And you need to know how things are working chemically to understand how they're working biologically. We also have a lot of cultural influences, particularly in the United States, that say that, in particular, math is hard. A lot of students will say that they're just not good at math. I know other people think that too. And some statisticians did a study that showed that a lot of biologists aren't doing their statistics properly. And they'll probably tell you, these are people with research PhDs, that they're just not good at math, too. So are people naturally bad at math? They're not. <laughs> and I'll go into that in a minute. One other influence in the United States is that uh, there's a predominant view that females aren't as good at math and science as males are. So a group of um, researchers looked at 10th graders and compared males versus females in math grades. There was no significant difference between their grades at all. However, when you look at the more challenging courses, as you progress through, particularly in college, it seems that females do start to get lower grades than males on average, even when their GPAs match in the arts and humanities with those students. Even in biology departments, where 60% of undergraduates are female, you find a slight decrease in grades among females. It's about 2.3%. The study that found that looked at the interactions the students were having. While males and females were equally likely to ask questions, females were significantly less likely to raise their hand or volunteer an answer to an open-ended question. So it seems that the biggest factor is confidence. I also want to point out that these differences aren't found in all countries. In other cultures, where it's not assumed that males and females have differences in the math and sciences, you don't find these gray degrees. So the biggest thing is to develop confidence in your skills. It's okay to not understand something. It's perfectly reasonable to have a question. So make sure that you ask them. And for faculty, make sure that you encourage your students when they get things right. So back to math. <laughs> Since math is hard, there is a big study that's found that IQ is not correlated to math skills. There was a slight difference in intelligence factors when you looked at the early development of math skills, like going into elementary school. However, there was no correlation between 
IQ and math grades going on throughout the rest of your career. They did a bunch of different studies and they looked at what happened and what those differences were between students that were doing really well and those who were doing not as well. And they found that the biggest indicator of success in math classes was motivation and developing good study habits. So the keys to that are thinking critically, connecting to other topics. It's okay if math isn't your favorite subject. It's not going to be everyone's favorite subject. Even mathematicians have courses that they don't like. My best friend is getting a PhD in math. She doesn't particularly like statistics. So that's okay. You have to be able to connect it to what you are interested in. So see how it's relating to the courses that you do enjoy. The other key is you can't just memorize how to do every equation and expect to be able to succeed in it. You'll get burnt out, you won't enjoy it, and you're not actually processing the information if you're just memorizing it. This is something that we kind of understand when we think about something like music. When you think about musicians and learning to play, they don't start out being able to play instruments well. They take time, they practice at it. They start figuring out how to compose music on their own. They don't just memorize exactly what to do for every song, or they'll never advance in their careers. So you need to invest time into math to be able to be good at it. And then it will get easier. So try to keep that in mind the next time you're working on a tough problem. Now what can you do to succeed while you're still in school? There's a lot of skills that you'll develop, and these are skills that you'll need to take with you into, the, into your careers. The first is to work with others. You'll find that different students and your friends are going to be better at some courses than others, and you'll be better at some courses than others. Everyone has different things that interest them and different skill sets. So one of the best things that you can do right now is to form study groups. Even if it's a course that you're doing fairly well in, it's a good idea to work with other students. If you're the one who's stronger in that field, you'll be able to learn and integrate more of that information by explaining it to those who you're working with. And then when you're in a class and you're not doing as well and one of them is doing better, you'll have someone to ask for help. You also need to develop problem-solving skills. Again, you can't rely on just memorizing everything. You can't memorize all of STEM or even all of any science. You're going to always have to look back, look through your notes, look through other research in order to figure out the solution. Try different ways of solving a problem. Go about it from different angles. Take a break. If you're getting overly stressed about something, go for a walk, go do something else, and then come back to it and see if you can't solve it. And again, work with your study groups. Use information from other courses. I can tell you that professors will love it if you comment that, oh, hey, this reminds me of something that I learned in this other class. Is that how they work? Are they working the same way? When you synthesize that information, your brain is making new connections to help you remember what you learned in both of those classes. And then always ask for help if you need it. Professors are there to teach you and to instruct you. If you need help, if you can't solve a problem, ask them. They always have office hours. Everyone has email. You can email them questions. Grab them after class if they're there. But don't be afraid to ask for help. Now something that you're going to have to do is learn to recover from failure. This is something that you're going to have to keep with you throughout your career if you're in the STEM fields. I'm not just talking about doing poorly on a test or in a course, but when you're working on something and it doesn't work. If you're in a lab and something breaks, or if you're working on computer coding and it doesn't work the third time you've tried it, you have to go back and figure out what you did. Don't get upset that it didn't work. Anyone who goes into research will learn quickly that when you're trying to do something new, when you're trying to find new information, do something that no one else has ever done, you're not going to get it right the first time. It's easy to see that now, but it's very frustrating when you're trying to design something and it keeps not working. But remember that this is how you create new information.
information. This is how we add to the communal body of knowledge that we have. So start accepting failure now when it's slightly easier when things don't work later. It's also a good skill to have in life. And above all, while you're in school right now, maintain your focus. Don't get overwhelmed by all of the classes that you're taking. Think about why you're doing it. Remember your goals. Remember what career you're looking for, what you're trying to get into. And that will help give you that motivation that you need to succeed in these classes. Remember that motivation is one of those key things that help you succeed, even if you don't like a class. Now I'd like to talk about one of the experiences that I've had in the STEM field. Um, I worked as a marine mammal observer on seismic survey vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. So those boats use high pressure air guns to survey the ocean floor to look for oil. They also use those, goal, those air guns on oil rigs to position them so that they're in the correct place. I was on board as a marine biologist to track the species around the boat, see how they were affected, and to make sure that the boats were following the government regulations as to when they had to turn the air guns off due to wildlife. We also tracked migrations of the birds and other animals, and it was overall pretty fun. But I did work mostly in the Gulf of Mexico, which you may have heard occasionally has hurricanes. So in September of 2008, Hurricane Ike came through. I was on a boat called the Chico Snapper, which is a about 220-foot boat. The bridge was about 35 feet off the water. You can kind of see it up there at the front of the boat. Um, we were in Galveston waiting for the rest of the crew to change before we left. So I flew into Galveston, and once we got on board, we were waiting to get the, the instructions from our shore office. There was a lot of debate between the captains and the shore office, but the shore office really wanted us to try to head east and get up into New Orleans where we would be more protected from the storm. So we set out on September 8th when Hurricane Ike was just below Florida coming in. We were not able to make it to New Orleans. We were stuck about 25 miles offshore. The first thing that happened was we lost the power for our steering. So we had no way to control where we were going. Then the sewage flooded the first floor, which was also where the kitchen and all the food was. So we were stuck with potato chips for the next three days. Our, unfortunately, trying to fix the sewage, our second engineer dislocated his shoulder and was out of commission. And then when the chief engineer went down to try to fix the situation, he broke his leg due to the heavy seas. So then we were out of engineers. And then we lost the rest of our power. So we had no electricity, no engines, and no steering. We called the Coast Guard, and due to the intensity of the storm, the Coast Guard was unable to come and get us. So we had to wait it out. Now if anyone's been down to the Gulf of Mexico, you may know that in the 20 or 30 miles offshore, there's a lot of old oil rigs that haven't been cleaned up. With no power and no steering and no engines, we have no way to control ourselves in case we hit into one. Luckily, there was another much larger boat that was nearby that was able to come and anchor itself, and we tied up to them a few hundred yards away so that we wouldn't shift too far. We knew that there was something going wrong when on our third abandoned ship muster, where we couldn't actually get to the muster station since those were all outside, um, it was raining in one of the indoor stairwells. In the center of the ship, sorry again, in the center of the ship below the bridge, the interior stair staircase had water running down it. What had happened was one of the 60-foot waves, yeah, 35 feet above the water, had crashed straight through the bridge windows. Luckily, none of the captains that were up there, there was three captains on ship generally, were injured by it, mostly because the one had gotten out of the chair where something would have come in and hit him. So, unable to be rescued by the Coast Guard, Two chief engineers who had to be medevaced off, luckily before the storm got much worse, but when the Coast Guard had already said they couldn't. We were all sleeping on life jackets, 
wearing survival suits, and waiting to see if we had to abandon the ship. After three days, we were luckily in the clear. However, the boat was not in good condition. This was our common area where we normally had our computers and satellite phones that we could call people. That's everything that had fallen out that had gotten moved out of that common area. That goes down a full story to the gun deck. We had to clear that off to make space for our beds slash pillows slash life jackets that we were sleeping on. The best part of this story is that by some miracle, even though all of the railings were wiped out and the steel railings that were connected to the ship were at about a 45 to 50 degree angle, the grill managed to stay on board. <laughs> it lost, somehow I have no idea how this works, it lost the actual grill part that was inside, so it took part of the oven out and the freezers, everything had thawed, so we were able to make some hot dogs and hamburgers and things like that. So do keep in mind that depending on what field and career you choose, you may face actual physical challenges in addition to the mental challenges that you'll face. Obviously, my studies have been in a field where I do field work, um, but the other scientists on board the snapper, the majority of the scientists, were all geologists and geophysicists. Most of their schoolwork had been done on computers and sitting in classrooms. So they were not entirely prepared for that situation either. But in particular, wildlife biologists, foresters, anytime you're performing field studies, you may face actual risks. And you need to um, make sure that you do what you can to minimize those. Um, I personally soon went back to school to get my master's, which I had been planning on doing, but that does give me a little bit more control over where I'm doing my field work and what risks I'm facing. But if you do love adventure, which I do, so I share this story with you, uh, I want you to know that there are plenty of jobs in the STEM field where you can get more than your fill of adventure. However, all of the different STEM fields can be fulfilling and challenging in different ways. Now, how do you go from where you're taking classes now to riding a hurricane? The first step is going to be take advantage of where you are now. All of the community colleges have wonderful libraries and databases that you can use to find out information. If you find something that you hear in class, even if it's just a side note that your professor makes that interests you, take some time to go use the library and use those databases to find out more about that you'll probably find that there's more information that you could possibly synthesize, and you'll start learning about things that we still don't know the answers to. Um, also, as I said before, talk to your professors. Many of the community colleges have smaller class sizes. Take advantage of that. You have a lot of contact with your professors. You may not have that at bigger schools. See what they're interested in. See what they studied. See if you're interested in topics like that, like they are. Ask them. They'll have many insights, and they can give you guidelines on where to look next. Find a mentor. Okay. Once you find a field that you like, especially if you find a professor that you work well with, see if they'll mentor you. They can help you with coming up with applications, looking for jobs. I know that it can be daunting to think about either transferring schools or applying to jobs where, while you're already so busy with classes. But talking to professors can give you ideas of where to look next. Also, look into the research possibilities at your school. I know that's going to be one of the big topics that we're talking about today. But even though this is probably your first or second year in college, you can start doing research right now. The sooner you start on research, I think, the better. Doesn't matter if you're just looking up literature or if you're doing something hands-on in the sciences. Um, you'll be amazed at how much information there is. And again, how much is still unknown. You'll also find that it will probably get you hooked and it's going to give you a focus for why you're learning these things in classes. When you start doing research, 
you'll realize why they're making you learn all of those other things and courses that you don't care about, and you'll start really seeing how these fields all work together. Use the career service centers that your college has. These people are trained. They know all of the different ins and outs of looking for careers, applying to schools, writing your letters of interest, um, or working on your resume. They can really help you with where you want to go and help you figure out a roadmap so that you have some benchmarks for what you want to hit as you're going along. Also, look for internships in the field that interests you. There may be some available at your school. There may be some available at businesses nearby. I know that many students are working and going to school, but if it is possible for you to take some time out, it's very, it's very engaging. I did an uh, internship at the Smithsonian Research Center in Edgewater, Maryland, when I was an undergraduate, and it was an invaluable experience. I really learned how science worked and what a job in my field looked like. Also see what scholarships are available. Even if you don't think that you have a chance of getting it, apply for it. You'll get experience with writing, you'll get experience with advocating for yourself, and you might get a scholarship out of it. Now, before I let you go, with visions of all of the amazing things that you're going to accomplish, um, I do want to point out that there are some side effects to working in the STEM fields. Unlike other fields, you may find that your decision to work in STEM consumes your thoughts most or all of the time. You may start calculating updated statistics for the players on your favorite sports team during games. You may create models for better traffic or how to construct a better bridge while you're sitting in traffic. You may start coming up with ideas for new apps while you're sitting in a waiting room or waiting for class to start. When you hear about a new disease that you haven't heard of or different diseases, you may be distracted by thoughts of the life cycle of the parasite and the infection pattern and how it could be modeled for human populations. You may also find yourself distracted by a new concept that you learn, learn in class and spend hours on a tangent learning about this brand new topic that you have never heard of, even if it's never going to be on the test. You may even find yourself voluntarily working on problems that no one asked you to do. You may find yourself taking study breaks to study new topics. Uh, most insidious of all, you won't care. In fact, it's highly likely that you will try to spread this to other people. Luckily, there's already more information than any individual could possibly learn, and we're adding to it every single day. So any new thing that you can learn or add won't hurt at all. In fact, if there's no risk of running out of information, why not learn as much as you possibly can? Thank you all for your attention and for having me speak today. I'm so excited to listen to some of the student presentations and hear what you're doing. And thank you again. Um, I'm just a visiting professor, so I do not, but there are um, 
possibilities for students doing um, literature reviews right now. We have one of them here. Any other questions? Yes? Did the large boat today offer you any food? They couldn't get anything over to us, but once it calmed down, they sent over a fast rescue boat filled with um, more cases of water and snacks, and uh, I think they were where we got them.